Hey everybody, Bill1911 here. Hey, today we're going to talk about some interesting guns. Um, I recently did a video on this one. Uh, this is the 1873 Peacemaker. Now this is a, it's actually called a Ruger Vaccaro. And it's a copy of the 1873. Uh, its styling is the same, its, its ergonomics are the same. But uh, Ruger's done some things that are a little different in it that, one, makes the gun a little bit safer. Um, some of these type, you can actually slam fire them, okay? But this one you can't do that with. Uh, it's a really fun gun to shoot. I enjoy the heck out of this thing. But, so anyway, the next thing I want to show you is <clears throat> the preceding model to that 73. Now, right off the bat, you can see that there's some differences in this gun. One, there's no top strap across the top of the cylinder, okay? With the 73, there is a top strap. Okay, you can see the top strap coming across here. All right. However, this is where things get interesting. The 73, 1873, is a cartridge revolver. Okay. The 1871-1872, now it's called the 7172 open top. Well, because the top is open. But the 1871 and 1872 are the patents that were filed on this gun, okay? So, it's a neat little design. It also has on its side a loading gate, okay? Just like the 73 does. Now, one of the things I want to show you on this gun is that it has a firing pin built right into the hammer here. Now, this firing pin you don't want to dry fire this gun because you can damage that firing pin. But the other thing is, it is possible, okay, to slam fire this gun. So you don't want to load all six chambers and put this thing in your holster and walk around with it. You're going to want to leave a dead cylinder on the top for that firing pin to rest in without hitting anything. Uh, otherwise, you could end up slam firing it and... and shooting yourself so we don't want that now the big thing I wanted to show you about this gun is it comes apart in a completely different way than that 1873 with the 1873 we push the button on the side we extract the pin and the cylinder comes out through the loading gate okay with this gun there's actually a slide pin that slides all the way through the frame and mounts it. I'm going to show you that in just a moment, okay? Before I get to this, I want to show you this gun's roots, okay? This is an 1860 Peacemaker, or I mean uh, 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 Colt Army. Now, this one has some differences on it. One, it has a fluted cylinder, which that's, that's not common on, on the 1860s, okay? It's also plated and all that, which doesn't mean a darn thing. It just means it's pretty, okay? So the way this thing was loaded was you put powder in the chambers, and then you put a ball into the chamber. You rotate the cylinder to the loading position, okay? And then you pull this handle right here down, and it has a mechanical ram that pushes the ball down in on top of the powder, nice and tight okay then on the back side you're gonna put primer caps on each one of these little nipples okay right through this little loading cutout okay and after that it fires like a regular six shooter there could be some issues with these things sometimes one of them is you had to get the right size cap for these nipples if you don't get the right size cap one you won't get them on if they're too small if they're too big, you're going to have to kind of crimp them a little bit and then push them on to keep them set onto those nipples. Otherwise, they can fall off and you end up without a, fire, without a cylinder firing. Another issue that takes place with these things, okay, sometimes when you drop the hammer and it hits that primer back here on the back, fire will kind of shoot out the sides and sometimes you'll get more than one of these chambers goes off. So all of a sudden, you've got lead coming out of here, boom, and bullets crap flying out to the sides. So you want to be very careful when you're at the range with these things. Some ranges won't let you load all six chambers. 
it'll only let you load them one at a time. And the reason why is because these things will chain fire, these old 1860 black powder ones, all right? Um, it doesn't happen very often. It did happen to me once. Scared the fool out of me. I mean, it really it scared me. I thought it blew up in my hand. So that's the 1860. Now, let's move on to this beautiful little beast, okay? Um, the 1873, it was a cartridge pistol so that eliminated any of the problems or excuse me the 1871 1872 was a cartridge pistol and it eliminated the problems of chain fires and things like that because it was a metallic cartridge pistol so uh it's a really it's a really good gun and it doesn't have the problems as many of the problems as the 1860. this gun really was the transition between the cap and ball type revolver, that 1860 gold and silver one I showed you, and the advent of cartridge pistols, okay? This, this really made a difference, okay? Those cartridges got loaded in through the loading gate, okay? And as you can see, all six chambers are empty. Now, this gun, this particular gun, is chambered in 38 Special which makes it just a joy to shoot. It's so mild to shoot, you just stick it out there and pow, and it goes off nice, and it is definitely a sweetheart. So with that, I'm gonna show you how to take this thing apart. The way this one comes apart is very similar to the way that 1860 comes apart. Okay, as always, now I've shown you the cylinder is empty, but we also will want to re-verify that there is no ammunition present in the work area, okay? Uh, it's a safety precaution that I think is well worth taking. Um, any safety precaution I think is a good idea, all right? So, with that, let's talk about our three gun safety rules. One, always keep the gun pointed in a safe direction. Two, always keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot the gun. Three, always keep the gun unloaded until you're ready to use it. All right, so those are our three gun safety rules. Okay, so let's take this thing apart. All right, if you look, right here on the side of this gun is a kind of a pin that comes all the way through the barrel and fixes it in place okay the the pivot that the cylinder rotates on comes all the way through from the back of the frame all the way up to about here and then this pin goes through it and holds the whole gun together now to take this out there's also a little screw that's right here okay above that pin now this screw on one side is flat it's just ground off so that when you rotate the screw to that position, it allows this pin to come out. Now this gun is built by a company called Cimarron, and they're out in Texas. And I gotta tell you, this is a beautiful, beautiful gun. Um, the workmanship is just excellent on this thing. Everything is finished beautifully and fitted beautifully. I really, really just, I adore this gun. I love to shoot it. It's just, it's just great fun. So, what I'm going to do, normally I would say use a bronze drift on this, but since I don't have one, I'm going to use the side of this old plastic brush and use that kind of as a drift to push that pin out of the gun. Okay, it is moving. And we got to keep coming with it until we get it all the way out. Okay, and it does not want to come out easily. Okay, so after we get the pin to come all the way out of the gun, we're simply going to grab a hold of the barrel, wiggle it a little bit, and it'll come right off in our hand. After that, we pull the hammer back so that that locking dog that comes out of here is out of the way, and we can slide the cylinder right off the end. Okay? So... That's really all there is to it to taking this thing apart. And it cleans like any other revolver. 
uh, we simply get our gun patches out and go to work on it and clean it up. Um, this is, it's just a really fun gun to me because it is that transition point between the old and the new and it shows us the progression of how these guns developed over time. So with that, I'm going to get some cleaning patches out and get to cleaning. And it's, like I said, it's the same procedure we use on all of these. Um, so we're going to simply get in there and get all the dirt out that we can get our hands on. Okay, get it cleaned up. Like every gun, you're going to find places that it likes to collect trash. Okay, and that's just the nature of the beast. You're going to find that pretty much on every gun, and it may be in a couple of places that you don't expect, but it's the same. It's the same. I mean, cleaning a gun is cleaning a gun, really. Uh, the idea is to get all the garbage out of it. Now, the thing about uh, guns and dirt, all right, so there is kind of an issue that we do need to take, take a look at, um, and that is when you fire these things, all right, and that gas escapes from between the barrel, okay, and the, and the, and the cylinder, okay, what comes out of it is burnt powder, but there's also carbon in it. Now, carbon is very, very hard. Now, this isn't the kind of carbon that, get, that is attached to your oxygen molecules or anything like that. This is, it's almost like sandpaper, okay? So you want to get that out of there because everywhere where the metal comes together with another piece of metal, okay, and that carbon is in there, it's almost like a grinding compound, and it will make things wear out prematurely. So, in some of my videos, I've had some people disagree with me about uh, where I oil the gun and how much oil I put in the gun. And their comments are valid. I mean, it's not like they're, they're making uh, ridiculous statements. They're not. Their comments are absolutely valid. Um, However, I would always prefer to err on the side of lubricated instead of unlubricated. Uh, as a gunsmith, I've changed a lot of parts out, okay, on guns that wore out prematurely because they just weren't lubricated properly. There wasn't enough lube on them. So I'd rather have a little more than not enough. Uh, that said, you can over lubricate things. I mean, it's not impossible to do that. All right, so some of this stuff does not come out all that easy, and you may have to brush it a little bit, okay? Particularly in places where there's a lot of fine grooves, okay? Now, the one thing else I wanted to talk to you about is when you take this gun apart, okay, and you pull that pin out, don't use a steel drift, okay? Use something plastic. Use something made of bronze, something that's soft, okay? Because what happens is that you can actually damage the end of this pin and mushroom it out. And when you do that, then you're not going to be able to get it back through the barrel to hold the gun together, okay? So you want to be careful not to... Uh, damage the end of this pin by whacking against it with a hard hammer or, or a hard drift, okay? So we don't really want to use a steel drift on these guns, all right? All right, after we've got the frame cleaned up, we're going to move on to the cylinder, and we're going to clean it up, okay? Now, with a black powder gun, things get really dirty really fast, and that black powder is very corrosive. Um, it will rot steel in a heartbeat. So if you've got one of those 1860 cap and ball revolvers, make sure that you relentlessly clean that thing every single time you shoot it because you will end up having problems with it if you don't. A uh, lot of rust. A lot of rust. So we're going to clean up our cylinder first on the outside and then on the inside like we always do. No difference there. Okay. We're going to do the same with the barrel. We're going to start cleaning up the outside. 
Now the thing about this powder solvent is that you let it set on there for a couple of minutes and it's going to work its way into uh, the places where it's, it's coated onto the gun and it does a real good job. Uh, just let it soak a little bit and it'll be fine. Now, there are products out there that are specifically designed to remove lead and things like that. And they work very well too. Um, I kind of have a way that I like to do things and other people kind of have their own way. And that's fine. Whatever works for you, works for you. And that's fine. All right, so I think we're pretty well cleaned up on the outside. And now, let's get some patches and clean the bores. And mount it on our jag. And I'm gonna start on the barrel. Okay, now. Now, I make my own patches, my own gun cleaning patches. Um, I use a double nap flannel. So, what is a double nap flannel? Okay. A double nap flannel has uh, a fuzzy texture on both sides of the patch. Single nap flannel only has it on one side. So, what I do is I use this double nap flannel, and that allows me to turn these patches inside out and use them twice. Otherwise, we're just wiping dirt back into the gun if we keep trying to use the same patch. Now, I saw something else here that I'm going to address a little differently than I usually do. What I'm seeing is when I push that patch through there, I'm seeing a few little lead deposits come out of that barrel, which means I promise you there's more in there than what I'm getting out. So with this particular barrel, I'm going to go ahead and use a bore brush. Okay? What is a bore brush? Just what it says. It's a brush that we use to run down the bore and clean out lead deposits and things like that. So what they look like is this. That's your bore brush. Now, what I'm going to tell you about it is kind of important. Um, all right. I'm going to have to use a longer cleaning rod because I don't have quite enough distance to go all the way through that barrel with that brush. So I'm going to double check it to be sure, but I don't think it's going to work. We're going to see. Now, if you're pushing your brush through that barrel and you get halfway and then you try to pull it back out the other way, what's going to happen is those bristles are going to kink okay, on the brush and then the brush becomes too small and doesn't do as good a job at cleaning the gun so alright this one actually will make it through I guess alright so when you push that brush through you want to make sure that the brush goes all the way through the barrel and out the other side okay when you draw it back you pull it all the way back all the way forward okay and this is the way you brush your bore. You don't stop in the middle and pull it backwards um, because it will ruin the brush. Now, this cleaning rod turns, okay, which is really important because that allows that brush to follow the rifling as it goes down the barrel. So it twists in the barrel, the whole rod does. And that's how we clean that barrel up. Now, once you've brushed it a few times, we're going to examine the barrel. We're going to, we're going to check it out. So if you look down the barrel, you can see through it. That's no problem. But you can see through it a lot better, if I can get it in the right position, when I put the white patch behind it. So that kind of lights the barrel by reflecting the light up into there. So that's what we're going to do when we inspect the barrel. Well, I think I'm going to have to work on this a little bit more. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do now 
since I've been brushing it, I've loosened up some of the trash that's in that barrel. So now I'm going to put my jag back on and push a dry patch through the barrel to dry things up and to push out all of those already loosened deposits. So we're going to do the same operation, only with a dry patch this time. We're going to push it through. Okay, look at all the stuff that came out of that. Let me show you this patch. All right, so there's little pieces of lead on there. There's all kind of stuff, burnt powder. So as you can see, that got quite a bit out of that bore. And that's what we want. We want to get this thing cleaned up. So I'm going to put now another wet patch through it. Okay. And see if we can get anything else out of that barrel. Okay, we're going to mount it on our jag. Whoops, there we go. And go back through that barrel again. Okay, now, let me do this twice by turning the patch inside out. We'll do her again. Now, I'm going to push another dry patch through it again. And then we're going to reinspect the barrel and see how much we have left to do. See if there's more has to be taken out. And actually, it looks wonderful this time. We got it nice and clean. That's good. So, the last thing we're going to do to the barrel is we're going to take a patch and we're going to cover it with oil. Now, I always recommend an oil that is specifically formulated for guns. The reason why is because you won't get any negative impacts on the materials that the gun is made out of. Now this particular gun, I don't think there's anything to be negatively impacted at all. So it's not that big of an issue, but still, it's not a bad rule of thumb to go ahead and do that, to use an oil that's formulated for guns. All right, now, we're gonna push this nice oily patch through here. And then we're going to inspect one last time. And what we should now see down that barrel is that everything in that barrel should now be shiny. It should have a sheen to it. And it does. Okay, trying to get the light on it. Yep. Okay, that looks good. Nice and shiny and clean. Okay. So now we're going to continue by cleaning the cylinder. And it's the same thing. We're going to wet a patch. And we're going to push it through. And then we're going to turn it inside out and go to the next chamber. Until we've got all six of them done. Okay, so try not to lose track of which chamber you're working on until you get them all six done. And then we'll move on to lubricating. Okay, now that we've put a wet patch through all six of the chambers, we're going to go back with a dry patch now and we're going to dry them all and then we're going to inspect them to make sure that they're good and clean. Now looking through here right now it looks very clean but we won't really know for sure how clean it is until after we put that dry patch through it. Uh, I also told you earlier that this was the transition point between black powder cap and ball and cartridge pistols. Okay. 
And this was Colt's transition. There were other people working on cartridge pistols at the same t around the same time period. Now, I can't tell you which one of them did it first. I just don't know. I think it was Colt, but I'm not real sure. I'd have to do quite a bit of research to find out. All right, so let's dry up our cylinder. And again, same thing. You don't want to lose track of where you are, which ones you've done and which ones you haven't done. Okay. But as you can see, when we put that dry patch through there, all of the stuff that was suspended in the solvent is now coming out with the patch. And so this way we have a much better idea of how clean we are down in those chambers. Okay. Now we're going to continue this procedure until we've got all six chambers dried out. Okay, now that we've got all six chambers cleaned and dried, I'm going to take my rag and make sure that we're dried up on the outside and that just makes it less, a little less slippery to work with. Now I'm going to show you another product in a moment. Um, it's by a company called Birchwood Casey. And Birchwood Casey makes some really wonderful products. I have not come across anything they've made that I wasn't happy with. Um, normally I don't really endorse products like that. But I really am a fan of Birchwood Casey's products. And they're not the only company out there, that's for sure. And there are other really good products. I just happen to really like Birchwood Casey. All right, so there is one other thing that I want to do on this cylinder. Because it is mounted on the spindle the way it is, okay, I want to make sure that the inside of this bore is also clean, the center bore right down the middle. So I'm going to take a couple of moments and get some more patches because I've run out. Remember I told you I make my own patches. Well, I go through a lot of them. That's for sure. So, we're going to get some more patches out of our giant baggie. And we're going to start the same way as we did in the six chambers. We're going to mount a wet one right on there. And we're going to stick it right up through the middle. Okay, now, I don't know if you can see it, but we got a lot of junk out of that center bore. So, this is one of those places where that burnt powder and carbon can collect and cause us to have unnecessary wear. And, as I always say, I would prefer to err on the side of, let's make sure this thing is lubricated properly and cleaned. That's, I think, a good idea in the long run. Um, I've had, like I said, several comments about the way I oil a gun. Some people have been unhappy with it. And one of these, one of the situations is there, I don't think there's a right or wrong to this. Now, one way, um, if you get dust contamination down inside the gun where I oil it, Yes, it can turn that oil stiff and into sludge, and that is true. Um, but depending upon where you're from, uh, down here in South Florida, a dry day, and I mean this, is 75% humidity. I mean, I, I actually get nosebleeds from my nose being dried out when it's 75% humidity. Our normal days, and this is average, is 95% humidity all the time down here, and we are very close to the ocean. So the air is a little bit, or uh, the water in the air is a bit corrosive. So uh, we have issues with rust down here that a lot of people don't deal with. Um, really, any place that is coastal, that's close to the coast, uh, you can have the same situation take place with high humidity and high salt in the air. So, 
we're just going to make sure that we've got everything oiled thoroughly. So every about, oh, I'd say a year or two or three, whatever you're comfortable with, you might want to take your gun in and have a professional take it apart, put it in a um, ultrasound bath and make sure that everything is completely clean in there, all right? And then put it back together for you, lubricated. Now, I've changed a lot of parts that were worn out because they were insufficiently lubricated. I have yet to change a, a part that was over lubricated. I've never seen that happen. I've had to clean them, that is true, but I've never had to replace the part. So we're going to oil places in this gun and we're going to actually let the oil run down inside of some of these places like this locking dog that's right here. Okay, we're going to put a drop in there. Okay. We're going to put a drop in the loading gate. Now, I always say any release or loading gate, make sure you get some oil in that booger because if that thing freezes up, then you've got a problem with loading. You've got a problem with taking the gun apart. It is, becomes an issue. Okay, So we're going to try and get oil down into this thing so it's nice and lubricated. All right. Now, this oil, it's kind of like a penetrating oil, and it will kind of work its way through just about everything. Now, this gun uses an old technology. Uh, it uses leaf springs down inside of here instead of coil springs. So, uh, coil springs hold up better than leaf springs because that constantly bending back and forth on that metal, they tend to crack. Okay, it's just nature of the beast, not much you can do about it. So, we're going to run a little bit of oil on here. Okay, and a little bit around this gear. And that's it, okay. Now, to put it back together, there are two pins right here that are alignment pins on the frame and the main rod that comes through that supports the barrel. So when you put the barrel back on, of course it goes through that little hole, but you want to make sure that you get it lined up so that those two alignment pins go into place. Now once you push that barrel back together, now you can go ahead and put your pin back in. Now the pin has a top side and it has a bottom side, okay? The top side, you're going to see, has, let me get the light on here, has kind of a little cutout, okay, right here. Okay, now this little cutout area allows that locking screw on the side to rotate into its lock position. So, first we're going to ensure that the little screw is lined up so that the flat part, flat ground off spot on the screw is facing down. We're going to verify that our pin is facing up and we're going to simply slip it back through, okay? And then we're going to tap it into place with a soft hammer. Again, we don't want to really pound on this thing. Once it goes up against, okay, make sure that your cylinder moves freely because if you push that thing in too far, it's possible to cause that barrel to push all the way back against the cylinder and bind it up. Well, this one isn't bound up. It looks good. Okay. So now we're going to take that little screw and we're going to lock it back down into place just like that. And this gun is cleaned and ready for action. That's the 1871-1872 Colt cartridge revolver, commonly known as an open top. Okay, I promised you that I was going to show you a product by Birchwood Casing. Okay, and that's right here. This is a silicone towel or rag, and what this does is 
it does a real nice job of putting silicone on the outside of our gun and protects the finish. Okay, so not a difficult concept, just wipe that booger down, okay? Now there are certain places that are kind of prone to rust. And one, any place where you put your thumb or your finger, so you're going to want to make sure you clean that up, all right? And two, any place that is uh, kind of a bare, bearish metal, okay, uh, you want to make sure that you wipe that down with a rag, and that's going to keep everything nice and preserved, and that way you don't have issues with it. Now, there is one part that I wanted to show you that I didn't before, and that is the cartridge ejection rod on this is a little different, okay? You kind of have to twist it a little bit, and push it in, okay, while the loading gate is open, of course, which I didn't do. Okay, you're going to want to twist it a little bit, okay, and push it back, and it will push the empty cartridges right out through the loading gate, okay? So that's your cartridge ejection rod right there. Now, it doesn't take a lot of oil, but do put a little bit on it. Don't have to go crazy. All right. Work it in a little bit, and you're ready to go. Hey everybody, Bill1911 here. If you found this video to be helpful and informative, don't forget to like us, and please subscribe. And by all means, come to visit us at askbill1911.com. Also, I want to talk to you about something that's very important to us, and that's your safety. So please, don't try any of the things you see on our videos until you have thoroughly reviewed and understood our safety procedures. If you are under 18 years of age, do not try any of these topics without the express permission of your parent or guardian. Thank you.